the danger of climate change poses to the world. We're joined by Chris Field from Stanford, California. Chris is director at the Carnegie Institution's Department of Global Ecology. He's also the co-chair of one of the working groups at the IPCC. Chris, thanks for joining us. Now, the IPCC like publishes a major new report once every five years. This latest report that's just been released, what are the major takeaways from this report? I'd say there are three really central messages to the new report. The first is that climate change is occurring, it's caused by humans, and it's having impacts around the world. Those impacts will get more serious the more warming we see in the future. The second is that climate change is really a challenge in managing risks. We don't know exactly what the future will look like, but we can make smart decisions. And the third important message is that climate change is a problem we can solve if we're smart about it. But the longer we wait, the more expensive it gets and the more complicated it gets. Okay, and that begs the question, have we reached a sort of tipping point in the effects of climate change? Have we got to a point now where we may not be able to reverse some of the effects of climate change? There's no question that we have already seen impacts of climate changes that have already occurred. We've seen impacts on every continent and the ocean, uh, from the equator to the poles. Those effects aren't going to go away, and we'll see more effects in the future. The thing that's critical about action in the near term is that we can prevent the most serious impacts of climate change if we act soon. So are there essentially two approaches to this. One is uh, managing the effects of climate change that are already occurring and then preventing those changes from getting worse. In the scientific community we talk about two components of the response strategy. One is adaptation, coping as effectively as we can with the climate change impacts that can't be avoided. And the second is mitigation, decreasing the release of heat trapping gases to the atmosphere to decrease the total amount of climate change that occurs. An effective response to a changing climate has to involve both components. You once said we're, we are all sitting ducks when it comes to climate change. Um, are the changes in climate going to affect some communities more than others? One of the things that's striking, if you look at the impacts that have already occurred and at the impacts we project in the future, is that nobody's safe from the impacts of climate change. But for an impact to turn into something really serious, requires vulnerability or a lack of preparedness and it also requires exposed being in the wrong place in the wrong time and there are definitely lots of communities where vulnerability is high especially poor communities or communities where governance is weak or resources are limited and those are a real genuine source of concern but no one is protected from the impacts of climate change and then we also have those communities who live along coastlines if the polar ice cap is melting that will push ocean levels up uh, and that could affect coastlines, couldn't they? When you look around the world, what you see is pockets of vulnerability everywhere. People along coastlines are especially vulnerable. Uh, people in areas that are subject to wildfires are especially vulnerable. People who live in areas that are subject to drought are vulnerable. People who live in areas that could be subject to river flooding are vulnerable. Or people who live in areas where there could be heat waves are vulnerable. We see vulnerability everywhere. Certainly coastal areas are a focal point but they're not the only focal point All right and we look at the strategy being implemented right now I mean we see governments being involved they're talking about uh, setting targets on greenhouse gas emissions and things like that but what about ordinary folk people who don't have a direct investment right now in uh, climate change what can they do you know the way I think about it there are three things that every individual can do uh, some of them involve lifestyle choices, uh, making sure that your family and your home are as protected as possible. Uh, some are vote style choices, making sure that the government that represents you is taking a profile on climate change that's as responsive as you want it to be. And a third is invest style. You know, much of the technology and the business environment for dealing effectively with climate change is going to involve building new businesses or changing the areas that businesses are involved in. Uh, people who want to build businesses, people who want to invest in businesses should think about where the opportunities are in a world where a huge business opportunity is coping with climate change. Right, and I guess the other point is that people also have to be sold on clean energy. Uh, you know, the use of wind energy, the use of solar energy and things like that. Uh, does that require a bigger, say, uh, education uh, program to, to sell people on those forms of energy? You know, there are 
huge benefits of thinking about using energy more efficiently. Uh, efficiency is one of the cheapest ways to use less energy. It can save money at the same time it prevents greenhouse gas emissions. And then there are a huge other set of advantages that come from using renewable energy. Uh, less air pollution, less problems associated with public health impacts, uh, less problems associated with things like mining accidents. So if you look across the spectrum of investments in energy efficiency, which tend to be often the most attractive way to decrease energy use, and investments in renewable energies, a way to get energy without greenhouse gas emissions, there are a wide range of what you can think of as co-benefits, extra advantages of making the switch. The uh, week after the IPCC uh, report came out, uh, China and the United States announced a climate change deal at the APEC meeting in Beijing. Uh, what did you make of that? A couple of things. First of all, it's really important that the biggest emitters are involved in producing a solution. And it's really important that the U.S., which has been the biggest emitter over many decades, and China, which is the biggest emitter now and has some of the most rapidly growing emissions, are actively involved in discussing solutions. It's also really important to keep in mind the fact that not all countries are going to have exactly the same approach to finding a solution. And China, with a rapidly growing economy, uh, should appropriately be looking at a different timetable for emissions reductions than the United States. It's really important that both these countries, the U.S. and China, have ambitious targets. And there's an active debate going on now about whether the targets that were announced recently are ambitious enough. But it's critically important that the conversation be moving ahead. And I'm greatly energized by the fact that we're seeing really dedicated efforts at moving the discussion to the stage where we're seeing concrete accomplishments. Right, and you mentioned earlier on that some communities, like poorer communities, will be more vulnerable uh, to the effects of climate change. Um, do you see, uh, how do you see developing countries getting involved in this process to cut back on greenhouse gas emissions? There are many things that countries at all stages of development can do to protect their citizens from impacts of climate change. For many developing countries, the most important investments now are investments in adaptation. And some of the investments in adaptation yield a wide range of co-benefits. As an example, improving disaster relief and recovery services can help in climate-related disasters as well as non-climate-related disasters. Improving transportation networks can help get emergency services into and out of impacted areas. At the same time, it can help move uh, manufactured goods into and out of uh, remote areas. So there are lots of things that developing countries can do in the spirit of adaptation that also advance sustainable economic development. There are additional ad advantages for developing countries to think about as they expand their energy systems to make those energy systems as clean as possible. A clean energy system doesn't need to be an expensive one. It can be a reliable one with high energy security and local control. At the other end, in developed countries, there is one body of opinion, and we see that uh, in the United States pretty often, which says we don't want to see these measures being implemented because it's going to affect economic growth. How do you counter that? I think that producing the energy system of the second half of the 21st century is probably the biggest business opportunity of the century. Uh, there's no question that the energy companies of the 21st century may be different than the companies we have now. It may be many of the same players, but there are a huge range of business opportunities. They're going to be participating in a changing landscape. They're going to need to be creative and innovative and dynamic. But there's no question that this is as much about opportunities capitalizing on where the opportunities appear as it is about having to undertake the, the challenges of developing new technologies and new ways of accessing energy. Going to have to leave it there, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Chris Field talking to us there from A Stanford. real pleasure to talk with you.